I'm doing great, sir. There we go. Hello, everybody. I'm Dan Rice here, President of American University of Kyiv, and I'm excited to have our 23rd uh, AUK Talks, American University of Kyiv Talks. And uh, we started this over a year ago, and uh, I'll be introducing uh, a, a really a world leader in education, uh, Dr. Michael Crow. And uh, I'll first I'll introduce ourselves, and then I'll introduce uh, Dr. Crow. Um, so I'm the President of American University of Kyiv here in Kyiv here today. And today is June 14th, which is a very uh, uh, a big milestone day. Today is Flag Day in America, and it is also the 248th birthday of the United States Army. So today at the American University of Kiev, we raise the American flag for the first time in history above the university, uh, just below the Ukraine flag. So it will remain flying there and very proud of that. So Dr. Crow uh, is the uh, president of Arizona State University which is one of the most incredible universities in the United States. He's been president of the university for 20 years and has really transformed education at the university. He's a world leader in uh, education. Um, I think you're gonna really enjoy this talk. Um, his background, uh, you, can, you can Google it and get a lot of background, but uh, uh, he's got a PhD from Syracuse. Um, he's been president, as I said, uh, for, for 20 years. He was at Columbia as a professor prior to that. Um, but most importantly, I think you're, you're all here to hear Dr. Crow. So Dr. Crow, welcome to AUK Talks. Thanks, Dan. I might add, you know, on the anniversary of the forming of the Army, that was, of course, you know, General Washington had come up from uh, uh, Philadelphia to take over the Army after the Battle of Bunker Hill, or right at that moment, in fact. And I mean, it's just it's during the revolution, during the fight, the Army, the Army sprung out uh, uh, before the country was even formed, before the Declaration of Independence. So. Absolutely. And as an Army veteran, I'm very proud of this uh, birthday. We'll be coming up on our 250th anniversary in two years um, for the Army. Uh, and the U.S. Army is doing so much right now to support Ukraine. I know my classmates from West Point are three and four star generals. One of them is commanding uh, the the uh, U.S. forces out of Wiesbaden. And the U.S. is doing so much. Sure, I know we're here to talk about education, but uh, since we are here in Ukraine and the U.S. is uh, the primary supporter, what are your thoughts on uh, on American University of Kiev and um, and how we fit into your overall ASU portfolio? Since you do power uh, American University of Kiev, what are your thoughts? Well, we're we're, we're well, Dan, we're is so excited to be a part of uh, AUK in every possible way uh, through the emerging Ukrainian democracy, the further uh, spread of democracy in Europe, the the blunting of uh, Russian totalitarianism and uh, you know dictatorial rule and lack of democracy and all the things that that represents. Well, even in the founding of the United States, our founders saw that uh, education, including colleges and universities, were essential to the success of democracy. Uh, uh, President Adams, uh, when he uh, uh, helped author the Massachusetts uh, Constitution, has a whole section in there about the role of the universities and colleges in furthering democracy. The founders of the American uh, Republic, uh, even in the 18th century, most of them had gone to college and uh, were thoughtfully trained in you know, the underpinning uh, philosophies of Western democracy. And so American University of Kyiv being in Kyiv with all of its history and tradition and in Ukraine with all of its uh, natural uh, uh, power and uh, agricultural and industrial prowess. I mean, it's just, it's, it's kind of like, um, some combination of Iowa, Illinois, and Minnesota, uh, uh, you know, it, advancing into a new a new democracy, which for your listeners are rich agricultural and industrial regions of the United States filled with hardworking people. So for us to be able to be a part of AUK, helping AUK to get launched and move forward and so forth is, is an honor for us to be a part of this. It's a part of who we are. Uh, it's a part of uh, what we think is important uh, you know, we 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 believe that uh, uh, democratic institutions, including democratically run universities, are uh, one way to help people to be more successful, uh, help societies to be more fruitful, uh, help uh, uh, rights of individuals to be more protected, uh, all those things. And so we're very excited to be a part of it. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we look forward to hosting you uh, at the new campus, sir, when uh, when you come out and uh, sometime soon, hopefully the, the Riverport campus, which is such a historic uh, mm -hmm. building built in 1961, opened under Khrushchev, and now it is open. Um, we have students coming in 
on uh, for the fall classes in person. So we're really excited to uh, to be in person and to be powered by Arizona State University. So over the 20 years that you've been um, leading this effort at ASU, the, the campus, the, the, the whole college has changed. Can you kind of walk us through kind of your experience and leadership of leading such a large university through 20 years of change? Well, we have uh, about 83,000 students on campus here with us. Uh, we have about 600 degree programs. We have 100,000 degree seeking learners online. Uh, we do uh, approaching a billion dollars a year of research, uh, funded research activity in 13,000 individual projects involving about 30,000 people. Uh, and in, in, in all of that, uh, the most exciting thing that we've been able to do is to build an entrepreneurial university one where our faculty are not trapped in simple bureaucracies, one in which we don't just replicate what other universities do, one in which we build, we've uh, done away with 85 disciplines, 85, 85 departments, I should say, uh, schools and colleges. We've created uh, dozens and dozens of new transdisciplinary schools uh, that are important to the future, uh, schools for sustainability, schools focused on innovation, schools focused on new ways to think about engineering, uh, uh, the reason I'm giving you these numbers, we, you know, we've grown engineering from 6,000 students to 30,000 students in wow. just a few years. And we did that by finding robots that can teach calculus and uh, uh, building them and enhancing them. And so what we've built is a highly innovative, high speed, highly adaptive institution, uh, which is uh, really tremendously focused on um, uh, how can we be of greater service to the United States? How can we be you know, of greater service to our allies like Ukraine? Uh, how can we be of greater service to uh, highly aspirational universities like AUK? Uh, and so what we've done is we've, we've just found a way to design, build, and advance uh, innovation in the spirit of entrepreneurism. Uh, and I think the most important thing that we've done is we've, we've changed the culture of the university from being largely driven by... Uh, somehow a focus on the faculty to, a, to being driven by a focus on the students. Mm -hmm. um, and so we call it student centrism uh, and then serving the community like you wanna do there in Kiev. I mean, so it's not about the success of the university, it's about the success of Kiev. It's That's about the success of Ukraine. If mm -hmm. Kiev is more successful because of the university, then the university is successful. If you have successful universities and the place is not successful, well, who cares? <laughs> and so- Absolutely. Yeah, so we've built a whole new model. We call it the New American University model. There's a whole literature on this. We've written books on this, uh, background on, on all of this. Uh, uh, and, uh, and then we look for allies. We look for ally universities like AUK, where we can learn and work together, solve problems together, and move forward in new ways. And so in the 20 years, what this has really been about is something other than just administering a college administering, in fact, we have 20 colleges, but administering a university. This is about creating a whole new way to solve problems, a whole new way to advance our democracy, and a whole new way to advance our economy. You know, our, our it, it's kind of funny, people don't realize the US economy is, is in a positive sense is on fire. I mean, it's unbelievable. The rates of change, the rates of economic growth, the rates of progress coming out of the pandemic, you know, all these things. And in Arizona, it's even beyond the, the average for the United States. Uh, and so our university is involved in all of that because I love we to designed that. ourselves to be that. I love to hear you say how you led that change. And that's really what we're trying to create since we're starting a new school here, a new university. We're really trying to create a similar uh, culture here. And that's where, you know, I've talked to the whole team about being servant style leaders and, you know, yes. My job is to support the faculty and the faculty's job is to support the students. And so we're really flipping it upside down from what I understand is the former uh, Ukrainian uh, culture in, in universities. And that's what we're trying to do here is transform Ukrainian uh, higher education. So in, in the spirit of what you've already built in uh, Arizona, and you were ranked the number one school in innovation. How, how did you create a culture that was able to become the number one university in all of America in innovation yeah. yeah and that's for eight years in a row so so uh so the uh, that's our faculty and our staff and our team accepting nothing from the status quo uh the world doesn't need europe doesn't need ukraine doesn't need more universities like what they had what they need is more universities like what they need 
for what you had is how most people, you know, most people just build a university based on something that someone else has already built. Well, the world isn't even the same. Certainly in Ukraine, it's not the same. And, you know, after victory in the war, the reconstruction is going to then offer, you know, this immense opportunity, you know, to, to, to move forward on, on uh, many fronts. And so one doesn't need a standard university for that. So what you do is you empower your faculty, you empower your staff, you empower your team to be creative. You don't hold, you don't hold to only the normal pathways. Yes, you have some core things that are the same. Yes, you're gonna teach accounting. Okay, you're gonna teach accounting. But, but if you teach only accountants and you don't have the accountants also be trained in, in uh, entrepreneurial thinking or innovation, well, then you're missing something. If you, if you teach innovation, but you only teach innovation about businesses and you don't teach innovation about social enterprises or teaching enterprises or community development or uh, sustainability or new industry formation, then you're doing too, too narrow of an approach. If you teach agriculture, I don't think you guys teach agriculture, but but if yeah. you teach, but if you teach agriculture, so we have an entire school of agricultural business, mm -hmm. and what we're looking at there is how do you build whole new industries around agriculture? So how do you make agriculture around something other than growing food? How do you grow energy? How do you grow chemicals? How do you grow algae based on sunlight and water? And how do you, you know? And so, so the notion is you eliminate all the constraints and all the, uh, I don't know exactly who's listening, but but all the simpletons. I don't know what the I don't know what the Ukrainian or Russian word is for simpleton, but uh, <laughs> somebody over there knows. What it is. And so what I mean by simpleton is that if all someone is attempting to do is just to design the same old, same old, same old, you don't even need that. You could just expand what exists. What you need is um, a whole new. Like for instance, uh, one of the things that we realize is that the the most energetic, most creative, most rapid moving individuals that we have in our institution are the students and they're held down. They're held down and treated like children. And so they shouldn't be treated like, treated like children. They should be treated like um, young entrepreneurs. It's kind of funny, you can give an 18 year old a rifle and send them into combat uh, and ask them to do the job, but you treat an 18 year old student like they're a child. Uh, and, and, and so stop. Uh, and so what we do is we have students involved in everything. We have students involved building the most advanced X-ray, laser, chemical uh, uh, analysis systems, systems ever made. We have we have dozens and dozens and dozens of students forming companies, growing their companies inside the university, incubating their companies inside the university. We have uh, during the COVID, there was a global X Prize for masking technology. An ASU team of students won that prize, five hundred thousand dollars. The oldest person on the team was twenty. <laughs> uh, and and so what we did is we created space, we created opportunity, we created mechanisms, we gave them credit for their entrepreneurial activity and their inventive activity. So what I'm saying is that what one has to do is is forget the way that the you know uh, uh, I'll, I'll pick a, a a university Moscow State up up north in Moscow. So ASU surpassed them years ago in terms of productivity, outcome, academic capability, academic impact, research impact, research outcomes, students, student quality years ago, years ago, because that institution just sits there in a fixed structure. Uh, and, and, and so I'm hopeful that AUK through its relationship with ASU and with other universities and your leadership, uh, uh, you know, working with uh, with Centana in terms of bringing in uh, uh, expertise and so forth, can find a way to break out of the old model and create this, you know, unbelie unbelievably unique and powerful institution in the capital city of this uh, emerging European democracy. Uh, I, I love that. And uh, the comparison to Moscow State is so appropriate. Um, you know, I've done a lot of uh, writing about the leadership of General Luzhny and the, the Ukrainian military and the difference in breaking the culture yeah. of the old Soviet style and now yeah. being much more agile and versatile. Yeah. Uh, and I want to bring that to the students here. And, and, you, exactly and you can see that. So it's exactly that. Exactly that. Yes. It's a perfect analogy. And uh, and I think that's why Ukraine is uh, is winning this war is because of basic leadership and uh, uh, additional weapons and leadership from Western leaders is helping certainly supply them. But leadership changes the world. Yeah, all, I, all, all I can remember is the, the exciting news about the sinking of the Muscova by the two Neptune missiles flying close to the nap of the ocean. Uh, you know, and then I looked up the Neptune and how it was developed and where it was developed and what it's based on. And it's just, I just said, wow. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, that was a, 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 a country with no navy sunk the flagship yes. of the largest navy, one of the largest navies in the world. So easily, a, easily. That was great. That was a really good day with no um, losses. <laughs> General Zaluzny actually uh, signed a portrait of that and uh, gave it to me the first time I met him last May when I was his special advisor. Well, you, you uh, should you should you should tell him that everyone noticed that and notice and knows what it means. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, well, with regards to the the, the war in Ukraine, um, you know, uh, le leadership matters so much. What are your thoughts when you talk about General Zaluzny and his leadership um, compared to what you're seeing on the Russian side? What what do what do you, what do you envision? Is the difference well i mean the for one i mean uh leadership must be built on uh what i call positive passion and moral uh, basis i mean so 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 the, the 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 ukrainians are fighting for democratic uh expression they're you know their democratic freedom uh uh uh, uh self-governance uh elections uh uh, every democracy struggles when they first get going, uh, uh, including ours, including the American democracy, which still is young. I mean, all the democracies are young, including ours. Two hundred and fifty years. It's like who cares? I mean, that's that's really nothing in the in the in the in the broader time frames. And so, you know what what uh, you know the inspiration from Ukraine is, you know, the fact that uh, Ukrainians are are fighting to not be sucked back into uh, uh you know a totalitarian dictatorship uh and and uh and so the spirit of that the innovativeness of the of the units uh, of the fighting the uses of technologies the uh the uh, I, I saw these pictures of wealthy women in apartments uh, loading their AK47 clips and I was like go for it <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so and so uh you know that kind of spirit of everyone everyone being involved and everyone being focused focused and everyone rising up is inspirational to to uh all of us uh in the western world and in the united states or at least most of us in the united states we argue a lot in the u.s as you know but there's 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 a, a unbelievable support for ukraine and in terms of leadership the idea of leadership itself leadership in universities is a function of empowerment of the faculty to act like something other than simple bureaucrats and so so what one wants to do is is the presidents of the universities are are intellectual enablers they set the goal they set the objective they set the purpose they find the resources they find the partnerships and then they need to free the faculty from the life of the simpleton and the simpleton is well this is the accounting department and this is the economics department and this is the chemistry department and and we want all of our little tiny little resources and so one has to be one has to motivate the fact they to become intellectual architects and intellectual entrepreneurs and so the function of leadership uh probably similar to the ukrainian army uh is about innovation and adaptation not about rigidity so if you watch the ukrainian army it is unbelievably innovative they have to take weapon systems developed by lots of places they have to train people across multiple weapon systems they have to use different kinds of tactics. They have to compete against opposing forces of, of substantial size and backing. They've got to uh, uh, fight uh, 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 in unusual ways and adapt, 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 and adapt. There's, all of the phases of the war, in fact, have been different. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so likewise, universities should be no less adaptive, but most people in universities don't know this. They don't understand this. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they, they think universities are fixed objects that are run like you know, schoolhouses out in the, in, in the hinterland. That shouldn't be the case. They should be run as adaptive, changing, evolving things. Like I said, we've eliminated 85 departments, colleges, and schools, created 45 new ones. Uh, we created 50 new online degrees during COVID. We advanced the most significant innovations we ever have developed uh, in the entire history of the institution in learning, in learning technologies during COVID. Uh, we found whole new ways to learn, whole new ways to reach out, whole new ways to do things. The largest research projects that we've ever been involved in. We have a carbon capture hub that we've submitted. We have a hydrogen hub that we've submitted. We have major new unbelievable projects in you know $90 million, $70 million, $50 million, all that we've been winning and proposing in the last few months, all a result of our new way to be agile. And so if you look at the future, the future, uh, the future economic opportunity for Ukraine, let's say, if one is going to build it on the economy of the past lose you're going to lose you have to build an entirely new economy entirely new economy that's a knowledge-driven high-performing 
uh, computationally enhanced, uh, bio info nanotech enhanced economy, while, while building on a foundation of agricultural achievement and agricultural productivity and industrial achievement and industrial productivity that is uh, uh, going to have to rapidly accelerate. So the opportunities are massive, but if the universities in, in uh, Ukraine are all just standard issue, Russian model, German model, British model, universities of the past, mm, not going to happen. So you need new universities in AUK is one of those. Absolutely. And I mean, it's so refreshing to hear that, uh, you know, with us having just launched last year, uh, completely online, but we're opening in person, but having the backing of Arizona State University and having the learning management system, the curriculum design, all of your different programs, you know, we're just so far just the tip of the iceberg, but what we can bring to Ukraine from ASU is absolutely incredible. So thank all of your team and your, your, your faculty for having developed so much for us to launch here within Ukraine to help transform higher education. Um, to switch gears a little bit, sir, um, it's public knowledge that you are the chairman of uh, INQTEL, the CIA's right. venture capital arm. Yeah. Um, and you were recently um, uh, blocked by Mr. Putin from ever entering Russia, I believe, again. Is that uh... Ban banned for life? No more, no more, no more flowers, no more candy. <laughs> no vacations in Moscow. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> So uh, what are your what, what are your lessons learned from being chairman of InQtel and venture capital uh, uh, from that you can share with us uh, from the CIA? Well, venture I mean, I, th I think what's interesting is that the reason that InQtel was set up uh, 24 years ago, and I've been on the board for 24 years, I've been the chair for 17 years, you know, it was set up because the rate of change in technology is faster than any government can actually see it, uh, assess it or acquire it. And so how do you how do you plug in? Uh, uh, technology investment, technology assessment, and technology acquisition into the earliest stages of inventiveness. And so what we started doing with InQtel was investing in companies. So there was a company before Google Earth called Keyhole. We were, we were one of the first investors in Keyhole. Uh, there's a powerful company that's involved in all kinds of things associated with uh, national security and intelligence called Palantir. Uh, we were one of the first investors in Palantir. Now, we don't make an investment only. What we do is we find unbelievable people and unbelievable technologies, and then we we invest in the company with a project. So here's a project that will that will allow this technology to be used for some national defense, national security, or intelligence uh, related function. And, and so you make this investment, then that allows the technology to accelerate in its utility. And so we use this intersection of the immediacy of discovery of new technological capabilities by giving those new, those new capabilities a problem to solve, then nurturing the technology and the problem into expanded use and expanded outcomes. And so the key there, even relative to Ukraine or relative to AUK, is speed. Uh, it's being involved in the process of new company formation from the outset. Uh, it's about being so. So, for instance, InQtel now uh, reads or assesses thousands of business plans, thousands per year of new ideas and new companies and new technologies and new ways of doing things. Uh, and in doing that, there's an unbelievable awareness of where technology is going, and an unbelievable way to identify those technologies that would be of the greatest assistance to the United States and our allies and their interests. And so, um, we do projects not just for the CIA, but the NSA, the the you know the uh, Special Operations Command, everybody, uh, and and these hundreds of these technologies, and these technologies then accelerate into use probably you know ten x faster, ten times faster, twenty times faster than they would normally go. So the the key, and this is maybe a, an overarching point: how do you build a UK? How do you build Ukraine in its reconstruction? Uh, how do you do all those things and build for speed? Because those that can move the quickest, this is one of the advantages in the United States, is agility uh, mm -hmm. and speed, uh, alacrity. Uh, uh, and, so, and so how do you build for that? And so you need to design institutions, whether they're in QTEL, whether they're AUK or ASU, you need to build these institutions for speed and agility. Mm -hmm. Interesting. As you look at speed and agility, innovation, how do you foresee artificial intelligence, AI, impacting adult education, and uh, and 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 what are you doing to address it, if anything? 
Well, so, so uh, well, what we're doing is, uh, let me back up. So on May 8th, uh, I think somebody told me, somebody told me that on the ASU uh, uh, Wi-Fi network, we had 40,000 individuals logged into some form of AI at that moment, 40,000 individual units. And so whatever we're talking about, it's already done. I mean, so the systems, the systems already exist. So what we're doing is we're figuring out how to leverage these AI systems to enhance learning, how to channel students to discern, discern uh, uh, in, in the U.S. There's a phrase, Dan, that you'll know, but our Ukrainian friends might not know. It's called differentiating between shit and shinola. Uh, <laughs> and so, so how do you tell something from something that's real and something that's fake? Uh, and, and so, and so that's, that's, um, uh, also what we're working on, but we sort of see it this way. So, so I, on my, on my, uh, iPhone here, I have an AI system that I've playing around with for, you know, and I'm flying long flights between, you know, A and B five hour, 10 hour flights. You know, I, I'll, I'll be on the Wi-Fi on the plane and I'll be, I'll, I'll, I'll spend 10 hours in an AI environment, seeing what I can learn. So, so, uh, one of my recent things, I, so I, I look at AI as a system like it's the most intelligent assistant I could possibly have that costs me almost nothing. Mm. Uh, and so uh, I, I, I said, pretend the year is 125 AD. Pretend I'm a Roman centurion leading a legion through uh, uh, Central Europe. And I encounter a river that is 80 meters across with a three mile per hour flow. Uh, and I need to build a bridge. Uh, what are my technologies that I have available in the year 125 AD? So then it outlines for me all the technologies. Wow. And I say, what kinds of trees are in the vicinity that here that I need? How do I move them? How do I, how do I build them? How do I, what, what do I, you know, so I, 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 I it's, it's unbelievable. And so then it, it becomes my engineering assistant. It becomes my design assistant. It becomes my feasibility assistant. Now I still have to make the final judgment. I still have to make the final assessment, and I would also have to build the bridge. <laughs> but but it, it was it's unbelievable. And then and then I started toying around with it on, you know, all kinds of things where I just I just I needed like to talk to somebody about some complicated thing that I knew a little bit about, but not a lot. Uh, and so I would frame these questions, and then it was like I was talking to a person. Now, even if you're talking to a person, you don't believe everything the person's telling you because you have to think about it, but it's unbelievably powerful. So we're looking at it as an unbelievable tool to accelerate learning, which means then that, like whenever we hear somebody say, well, people are gonna cheat, we'll say, well, people always cheat. They cheated before pencils. Uh, you know, They cheated before there were books, then they cheated more after there were books because they looked up someone else's stuff, and et cetera, et cetera. So it's not they about that. They were, they were Russian too. So. Yes, yes, yes. And so, 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 so what we see it as is, it's time for everyone to up their game. So if an 18-year-old has access to AI systems that are helping them to think across any subject, then you need to intensify, accelerate, and expand the learning process dramatically. Because now they have a computational assistant working with them. So there's literally, you could ask them anything. And so you could say, uh, give me a fundamental assessment about uh, the accounting practices in Sweden as compared with the accounting practices in Ukraine and, and give me the advantages of both systems. And, you know, and so, and so it's gonna give you some, some place to start thinking about that, where that would, be, that would be a month's research that you could get done in 20 minutes. And so that means then that your learning process can be greatly accelerated and expanded. And that's the way we're looking at it. So um, to shift gears a little bit, um... You know, you over 20 years, you've increased the diversity on campus uh, dramatically. Can you share your thoughts on how that's changed the university? Um, any challenges you've you've had, and um, and where to go in the future? What we can learn from your lessons? Well, for your listeners that don't know, so the U.S. now is around 340 million people. It's a very polycultural place. We've got We've got uh, people from every continent. We've got immigrants from everywhere. We've got groups of Europeans. You know, uh, my, my father's family came from England. My mother's family came from Ireland. Uh, but my wife's family came from uh, Ireland and France. Uh, you know, the, you know, somebody else's family came from Africa, somewhere else. I mean, and so, and so it, uh, we have every religion imaginable. We have, we have, uh, you know, it's 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 an unbelievably complicated and and beautiful uh, place because of its diversity. Well, 
in a democracy like ours, then the public universities have got to make certain that all groups can gain access to the university. So the way that we do that, we don't believe in quotas or any of those kinds of things. We just say, if you're qualified, you're in. So here's our qualification standard. If you meet our qualification standard, you're in. If you don't have the money to go to the university, we'll help you find the money to go to the university. If you're not qualified to go to the university, we'll help you to find a way to become qualified to go to the university. So, so what we've done is we've built diversity around that model. And then within the university, then what that has done is that has given us an unbelievable incubator for the highest levels of human creativity and finding ways to work together. And uh, we've got thousands of, of uh, Jewish kids and Muslim kids and Catholic kids and Mormon kids and Methodist kids and atheist kids. <laughs> we got it. We got everything. And, and, and so what we have is a set of core principles that bring everybody along to respect each other and to stay out of each other's, you know, business. <laughs> and, 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 and what that does then is that that creates a very significant um, um, learning uh, opportunity for everyone. So what you have, you know, uh, after the war, you know, Kiev will become one of the European capitals. It will become one of these cities that is attracting people from all over the world. American University of Kiev will have students from all over the world uh, coming there, uh, every country, every culture, every religion. Uh, and this is what happens in the big capitals of democracy if you think about about uh paris or london or you know new york or chicago or what have you washington this is what happens uh and so and 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 the same thing will happen in kiev uh and so in that then uh the diversity of the institution in every way becomes one of its creative strengths uh so if you look at a school like the london school of economics uh you know in central london i mean it's probably got students from 150 countries. Uh, uh, they're working on some of the most important ideas. We have students from 158 countries at ASU, by the way, uh, um, uh, almost uh, 12,000 of them. Um, and, um, and so what I'm saying is that then the university then becomes a center for creativity based on its cultural and ethnic diversity. That's fantastic. We, and we're trying to model uh, our university uh, similar to yours and and one of the things we're focused on, and you mentioned if people can't afford the university, you help pay uh, pay for it for them. Um, we're doing that here. We uh, we have uh, merit-based scholarships. Um, and we also really, we want to reward the heroes that have uh, fought for this country. So we've got a wounded yeah. warrior scholarships. We've got uh, spouses of fallen heroes and we've yeah. got children of fallen heroes scholarships. We, we, so we, we have all of that. We have 11,000 veterans and active duty military uh, attending ASU. Uh, we have uh, special programs for all of them. We have a special center called the Pat Tillman Center, a uh, name for an American hero who went to ASU, played football here. Uh, and so we have uh, we've had from the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and uh, other uh, service that our veterans uh, have made. You know, we have uh, every including wounded warriors and uh, PTSD uh, uh, affected soldiers and uh, Marines, airmen, sailors. Uh, we, you know, we've got we've got all that, and and uh, and we're very proud of the fact that we found a way to to help these uh, individuals, these men and women, to graduate, uh, to be successful, to move on with their lives. And uh, um, I remember meeting a young Marine who was back from fighting in Afghanistan. This was years ago, and he had a he had won a Navy Cross. I he wore a little thing that I knew what happened to be a Navy Cross because it's a very unique little emblem. Uh, and he, but he, this young man was also deeply affected by his wounds and, 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 uh, you know, we had to have special services for him to help him, uh, in, in lots of ways. And, and he, he was successful. So, so we, we look at this as, as a really important part of our institution's design also. And the yes. Tillman Center, you may want to take a look at the Tillman Center, uh, for, for your listeners, Pat Tillman was a football player at ASU and later a professional football player who then gave up his multi-million dollar a year contract to join the army. He ended up in the uh, Rangers, I think, of the army and then uh, was killed in combat in Afghanistan. So, Yeah, he was a superhero. I mean, he gave up a very lucrative contract to go serve as an enlisted soldier with his brother and, right. uh, killed in Afghanistan. And uh, yeah, I was a, a Ranger myself and uh, everybody has complete respect for him. And they've done a great job at Arizona State with the Tillman uh, right. Foundation um, and also the McCain Foundation, named after another uh, great. Yes, uh, yeah, we have lady. the McCain. We have the, the the McCain Institute for International Leadership, and uh, 
So we're running that in uh, uh, Senator McCain uh, uh, picked us in a contest to be the home for the McCain Institute and for your Ukrainian uh, listeners. I mean, uh, John McCain, uh, before his death, was focused on the success of Ukraine with every ounce of his energy and uh, spirit uh, long ago, back when all this was getting started before the invasions. Absolutely. He really helped get uh, Ukraine prepared for this war as much as possible. Um, and uh, and the McCain Institute does phenomenal work as a think tank. We're also doing some work here as a think tank, and we're doing some demining uh, research and work. We're doing some work on military law and some other things trying to model after the McCain Institute. Um, uh, speaking of diversity, sir, you uh, uh, you grew up in a naval naval family, right? You, yes, uh, uh, right. You, <laughs> what lessons learned uh, growing up in a military family uh, did, did you have? Well, my dad, my dad was an enlisted guy. My parents were teenagers when I was born. So uh, my father, I think, was an E2 when I was born or an E1. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, we didn't have many resources. Uh, and so uh, what I learned being in a military family was um, uh, never to complain, uh, uh, always to adjust, uh, uh, always to understand that, uh, you know, uh, to protect one's country, um, to, to um, uh, <clears throat> always, I mean, my, my father uh, worked more than one job, even when in the Navy, he had, he, he didn't make enough. So he had other jobs, even when he was in the Navy. And so just to work hard and, and uh, protect and defend and honor your country. I mean, that's, that's, that's what you learn and, and uh, no complaining. Uh, if if uh, if you complained about your food when I was growing up, my dad would just take it away. Say, how about none? <laughs> <laughs> so as you look back on your career, sir, what 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 would you say your legacy is and what would you like people to think about when they when they look at your career? Um, it's been such a successful, incredibly successful, impactful. But what do you look at as being the most important legacy? Well, I mean, for me, you know, what I hope somebody is able to say at some point is that, um, uh, you know, we were as a team uh, of which, uh, you know, I was the quarterback, uh, American football analogy uh, at ASU, we built a truly high speed, adaptive, American, egalitarian, successful new university. In a sense, we built this new model for what America needs going forward, uh, not just the kinds of institutions that we had in the past. And, and doing that, you know, building new kinds of universities, as I'm sure you certainly know by now, is exceedingly challenging. I mean, it is very, very difficult because uh, there's this obsession with uh, tradition and this obsession with method. And then there's the faculty themselves. I'm a faculty member. You know, I write books. I do all that kind of stuff. Um, and so but I, I think you know, what I'm hopeful for is that people say, well, he, uh, Michael Crow, was a person that really helped to build this new kind of university for the United States and our future. That's great. Now, prior to joining the university, you looked at a number of different universities. How did you choose ASU and what was your thought process in, in choosing as our students are looking at what their future jobs are? What was the thought process you went through in, in deciding that? So for me, what I was looking for was, you know, the, you know, where would I have an opportunity to take the biggest chance, the biggest risk, the biggest challenge and have the biggest impact? Uh, a lot of people are looking for the biggest salary or the biggest this or the biggest that. I mean, like, uh, yeah, d salary doesn't mean anything. It's important. You got to pay your bills. But, uh, um, you know, what I was looking for in this in this role was where could I make the most significant contribution that I uniquely am able to make? Uh, and, uh, you know, lots of people can run a college. Lots of people can do this. Lots of people can do that. But uh, what I wanted to do was to design a new kind of university, and this was the place that I thought I could do that. Wow, I see a lot of parallels there with the my role at the, as president of American University of Kiev. Yeah, this is yeah. a, it's a high risk, uh, but a high, very high return. It's so rewarding to be part of something like this. Obviously, much smaller than Arizona State, but that's that's an amazing answer. Um, we have a couple questions from the uh, from the audience, okay. sir. Uh, so uh, from uh, one of our vice presidents at AUK, Alexei Sheresnov. Um, President Crow, could you tell us about the CHIP Act, CHIP Act, and the ASU role there? Yeah, so the Chips and Science Act is a almost sixty billion dollar uh, uh, congressional bill signed by President Biden that creates a whole new focus on uh, uh, returning to the United States and to North America 
uh, the industrial uh, platform for the most advanced manufacturing of uh, microelectronic chips, as well as the building of a new research trajectory. The U.S. was the foundation in which semiconductors were built. The U.S. was the place where the microelectronics industry was uh, designed and developed. And then over time, manufacturing got offshored. Uh, we're now returning that to the United States, accelerating the research activity. ASU is deeply involved in all of these things. Um, we are building new uh, regional, uh, we've proposed a new regional Department of Defense uh, semiconductor research center. We have, that's a $400 million project plus or minus. Uh, we have, uh, we're now the home, Phoenix is now the home to Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company's new $40 billion foundry that's being built right now as a part of the relocation of manufacturing um, you know, one of the one of the uh, biggest vulnerabilities of the Russian military right now is that uh, they don't have any uh, Russian based design or manufacturing of advanced semiconductors. So all their components of their advanced we weapon systems come from somewhere else. So they're, you know, they're without a, uh, a stream of these kinds of technologies being built themselves. Well, we don't want to see that happen in the United States. Uh, and so we've taken immense steps with the Chips and Science Act, and ASU is intimately involved in all aspects of it. Fantastic. With regards to uh, industry, how do you lead a, such a large university and keep tightly connected with industry um, so that you're giving back to industry and vice versa? So we have uh, a fantastic industrial uh, uh, development staff. We have corporate affairs staff. We have fabulous people working on that. Uh, we're deeply, I mean, most things are just a function of what are you actually committed to. Uh, and so we're committed to close relationships with companies. We're committed to partnerships with companies. We're committed to technological partnerships, learning partnerships, teaching partnerships. Uh, companies come to us and say, we need a degree in this. We need a program in this. We need an educational thing in this. We build it. We design it. Uh, we advance it. Um, you know, the... Uh, uh, um, Raytheon Missile Company, for instance, which is one of the, the main uh, American missile manufacturer, we're a strategic partner of theirs for people. Uh, they're moving a, a thousand person tech center uh, here to Phoenix uh, to be on one of our innovation campuses uh, where our engineers, our software people, others will work with them. Uh, so it's basically you, you stay close and you work together on, on these things. And so it's about proximity. I love Raytheon. They uh, they're they're making so many of the precision guided weapons we have here that that are saving Ukraine. Uh, they make the Patriot, the Stinger, the Nasams, uh, the Javelin. There's actually children being born in Ukraine now being named Javelin and Javelini, um, and uh, after after the weapon system. So yeah, they're they're they're. Doing I, I, I was I was a uh, Javelin thrower when I was in college. <laughs> <laughs> Different kind of Javelin, but <laughs> so. Um, uh, one of the questions from the audience are, um, is, uh, what are your thoughts on the future development and direction of social sciences in higher education? Social sciences are uh, infinitely more complicated than physics, chemistry, or biology. Uh, they're bantied about and uh, often attacked because of their lack of precision. Uh, if we don't develop better social sciences, we won't have better social outcomes. Uh, and so social sciences are essential to everything. So we're so we built, for instance, the Global Futures Laboratory, which is focused on a sustainable future and adjusting to climate change and in a positive way and so forth and so on. We have engineers, we have scientists, we have economists, we have social scientists, we have everyone involved in that. So, so we look at social sciences as essential. So for instance, even in finance, you know, finance has been proven to be a lot more than math. It's also psychology. Well, psychology is a half social science, half natural science. And so if you don't understand human psychology and human motivation uh, and human organization and, and so forth, well, you don't understand anything. Uh, and so, so social sciences are uh, essential to what we're doing going forward. Absolutely. I remember one of my first classes at West Point was psychology, and I didn't understand at the time, being 18 years old, why we were studying psychology, but it was leadership is all about psychology and understanding people. So uh, that's a great example. Um, so. Uh, uh, as we, as I look to the to the uh, crowd, I want to make sure I get all of these uh, questions. So, as you uh, as you as you speak to younger students that are interested in being in higher education, what are your thoughts about the future of 
higher education as a professional educator? And how would you see the the the, the evolution going forward? Because you've seen, obviously, for the last 30, 40 years, what do you yeah. see going forward? Yeah, so so what we what we've come to realize is that higher education has made somewhat of an error by becoming basically the 13th, 14th, 15th and 16th grade. <laughs> Meaning it's just like a continuation of of high school. Uh and in fact what higher education needs to be is that plus lifelong education. And so we're involved now in evolving the university around the notion of having a completely immersive learning environment on campus. And we're going to grow that to about 105,000 students from our present 83,000 students. Uh, we'll have students from 160 countries uh, uh, across uh, 600 majors, uh, graduate and undergraduate majors. And so, so we're going to be continuing to expand that. And then we realize that there's hundreds of thousands of people that we could then also help get a new degree or finish their degree that they didn't finish by our online activities. And then we realized that if you took our 30,000 courses and our 400,000 course modules and you disaggregated all of those, then people that aren't students in degree programs would also have things to learn. So now we have 500,000 of those learners also, and we think that we could reach more. And then if you took, if, if you then took content from other places, uh, other universities, uh, you know, YouTube, uh, the military, other places, if you took all of that and brought it all together, maybe you could create learning pathways and learning platforms and learning badges and you know different ways that people can learn. So right now we're building a three-part enterprise. We have an academic enterprise, which is our degree programs and so forth and so on. We have a learning enterprise, which is learning available to anyone, anywhere, any scale, anytime in their life. So, so maybe in the rebuilding of Ukraine, you know, maybe a microelectronics plant gets uh, planned to be built in Ukraine. Well, then how do you train all the workers, you know, that that were electricians that now want to be electro, electro, uh, electrical engineering technicians? How do you get that done? Well, you do that through these kinds of things. Or uh, uh, right now, I, I passed this morning here in Phoenix, three vehicles that had no drivers. These were autonomously driven taxis. Wow. Okay, so when drivers get replaced... How are you going to educate them to be able to become something else, to earn more money doing something different? And so, um, and so that that's the approach that we're taking. And then the last enterprise we have is the knowledge enterprise, which is us building research centers, research initiatives, research laboratories, social sciences, humanities, physical sciences, engineering, chemistry, space exploration, everything you can imagine. So we're building all three of those. And so we've just taken this different kind of approach. To our design, and that's that's what we think is the new the new trajectory for higher education. Wow. Well, you've also done one of the most innovative uh, partnerships I, I think I've ever seen in education um, with Mr. Howard Schultz, founder of Starbucks. Can you describe the partnership you put together with him? And also, uh, we are very interested in getting the first Starbucks in Ukraine in American University Kiev. We already yeah. have a spot like that. For it, so. so, so in the U.S., uh, Starbucks is a big company. It's a big company globally. In the U.S., they have two or 300,000 employees, and many, many, many of their employees that work in the Starbucks or for the company went to college but didn't finish and wanted to finish. So for whatever reason, they dropped out. Maybe there was, a, uh, maybe they had a medical issue. Maybe something happened in their family. Uh, maybe they flunked out, whatever. Uh, and so in the U.S., typically in the past, well, then you would be done. Well, not anymore, because in Starbucks, we built this program where if you work at Starbucks more than 51%, if you have a half-time position or higher, you can go to ASU online at no cost. Uh, and so we have graduated 10,000 people from that program. We have 25,000 people enrolled in that program. And then we have 600,000 people that have been enrolled, not in degree programs, but in courses from their families. So we've created then around Starbucks a way for you and your family to um, uh, advance yourself. We have another another American company that I don't know if you've heard of Uber, uh, but uh, and so Uber also at we have thousands of Uber drivers in a particular category of drivers that are also ASU students. Uh, and and what we found is that they're some of our most tenacious, most successful, most capable students. 
Wow. And it must really uh, increase employee retention too. The company probably retains all these employees that are getting their free education. So that's got to be better. It's, it's not just that, but they then, they also produce their later managers. They produce, uh, they don't, you're not required to stay in the company. You, 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 you produce a better person. Uh, and, um, um, and that's, that's really one thing that a company should do. The, the company shouldn't just use up the person. They should help build the person because it's beneficial to the company. It's beneficial to the society. It's even beneficial to other companies. One doesn't want a world in which all the companies are failing. One wants a world where all the companies are moving towards success. And this is one way to help ensure that. Now, that's fantastic. Hopefully more and more companies will, will mirror that and, uh, and follow the leadership of Mr. Schultz. And, and, and you. thanks for putting that together. That is amazing. So um, we have a question here on... Um, uh, uh, from, um, let's see, from Latin America. Um, how do we create um, a value in this world full of challenges um, from Costa Rica um, from a global perspective, talking specifically from Latin America? Well, uh, so one, we just have to face the fact there's always challenges, always have been challenges, and always will be challenges. There's nothing about anything that humans do that isn't challenging. We live in a complicated place. There's a challenge by itself. Accept the challenges, embrace the challenges, uh, uh, you know, I'm of the view that you, you, you run to the problem. You don't run from it. You run to it. Uh, because if you're able to get to the problem and begin solving it, then you see opportunity from that. So in Central America, you know, in, in uh, Costa Rica and other parts of Central America, you see these emerging new economies, new democracies. Uh, some are moving at different speeds. And so what one needs to do there is focus heavily on human capital development. Uh, getting people capable of competing and being a part of an unbelievably rapidly evolving uh, economy. The gig economy is now global. People can be anywhere. People can work from anywhere, but they have to be ready. They have to be educated. They have to be capable. And so uh, the, the main challenge is then, therefore, human capital. How do we get, how do we get everybody up to a level of, of learning capability and learning adaptability that they can be competitive globally anywhere from any country in the economy, helping to build the regional economy or the local economy by participating in the global economy. That's really what we need to figure out how to do. Great. So uh, to, to close out, sir, what do you think? I know a, a lot of our uh, students are on here from here in Ukraine and we're in person going to school. Uh, so the, the campus is open. What, do you, what is your view from the United States of the current situation in Ukraine and the American support, uh, both in Congress and from the public support of Ukraine? Can you give them your perspective? Well, it's really a historical perspective. So, you know, since the end of 1945 and the defeat of Germany and Nazism, you know, Europe has seen unbelievable stability. Uh, ultimately, the parts of Europe that were consumed by uh, Russia uh, were then freed again, and Russia returned to you know nearly its original position. Uh, that took another 45 years to do that. Uh, but in the last 30 years, that huge progress has been made. And then in those parts of the former Soviet empire that have decided to go democratic, so the treaty signed by the Russians in the mid-1990s is unequivocal. If the nuclear weapons are given up, uh, in Ukraine, then Ukraine can be a free and independent uh, country and a part of Europe. And so uh, uh, right now, uh, that will be attained. It will be costly, but it will be attained. Uh, nothing is free. Uh, freedom is not free. Democratic progress is not free. It wasn't free in France. It wasn't free in the United States. Uh, uh, it's not free. And so uh, it has to be paid for. Uh, and so, so the, the, the payment is being made now, and then it will be done. And then Ukraine will take its next steps. Uh, it will move forward to its next levels. It will join the, the, the broader uh, 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 world of uh, free and democratic uh, governments in Europe, and additional progress will be made. And Russia will have to reassess uh, its uh, uh, lack of intelligence. Uh, you know, they had their chance to do the same thing uh, and have chosen not to take that path. And so maybe this will help them to see that this is still a path for them. Uh, I will say that I've been to Russia many times and the Russian people are, are fantastic people. Uh, and so what I mean by that is, you know, there's a spirit there that's being suppressed. 
Uh, and uh, I hope that someday they can see their path to democracy also. Well, thank you very much, sir. And uh, last week we had General Petraeus, uh, David Petraeus, in person on campus and, uh, you know, former CIA director, commanded two wars, and he was very complimentary of you and uh, and obviously knew you when he was director of CIA and uh, your work with uh, Incutel. So he was very complimentary. And just so the audience knows, you know, this is the 23rd AUK talk. Um, last week we had General Petraeus, the week before we had Deb Cup, the, the president of Microsoft US. You know, we're getting incredible speakers. But, sir, it's been an honor to have you here. Uh, I hope the audience really enjoyed it. I'm getting all kinds of comments in the chat room, so everybody really appreciated it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your leadership. And also, thank you for your support of AUK and all that ASU does for AUK. What, what, whatever, whatever you need, we're going to be helpful, and I hope you know that. And thank you for the time, Dan. And it's nice to have a chance to uh, see that beautiful space behind you and have a chance to uh, uh, talk with all the folks. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Go Army. Yes. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.